Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to everybody who's watching all around the country and maybe around the world, as well as the folks who are in the hall tonight at the 2017 New Canaan Society National Retreat. And they do make noise. They are known to make noise, and we have lots of reasons to make noise tonight, but uh, one is we have with us Paul Young, uh, who is... I bet every day for you is a big day, but this is a big day in that today is the uh, official premiere of the movie of The Shack, which is a novel that Paul wrote a number of years ago. Uh, and that gives us a great excuse and opportunity for a conversation. So we're going to get to talk oh, together, Like we Paul. need one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it hasn't happened for a few years, so I, I am so happy that it happens and thank tonight. you for doing this. I'm so excited to get to talk with you. We have a lot to cover. Um, I want to start with this uh, before we talk about the movie. We'll talk about the movie, then we'll talk about the book, but mostly I want to talk about you and your story. Okay. As I actually am more interested in books than movies and more interested in people than books. <laughs> and I think you are the most interesting thing, even more than your wonderful book. But before that, the very first time I met you, which was maybe seven years ago or so, mm -hmm. and every time since, you have greeted me and everyone else within range with the most wonderful hug, or hugs, or extended manly embraces that I've ever experienced from anybody. I am guessing you didn't always do that your whole life. Maybe you did, but I want to know the story behind the hugs, because you are a hug extraordinaire Thank you. person. So I'm little. I have to be good at something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the... I grew up in a very tactile, tribal culture in the highlands of New Guinea, like everybody. And, uh, <laughs> as, <laughs> as one does, yes. Um, and it's interesting, I'm the most tactile, I was the first born, I was a year old when we went into the culture. Um, and we have six kids, nine grandbabies who are nine years old and under, so hugging, I practice a lot. But, <laughs> There is, a, there is something that happens inside of a hug that communicates what's going on in a person's heart. And for whatever reason, it is one of the easiest ways for me to, to communicate to someone that they matter and to also have a sense of what's going on. And because we carry our worlds in our bodies as well. Plus, we live in a world where touch has become dangerous and it needs to be redeemed. You know, this, I, I, I am, I'm in signing lines, signing books at Costco or, you know, a, a Barnes & Noble or something, and there are, are lines of people, and I hug every single person unless there is a sense that that is really dangerous for them, because for some people, they're so hurt, you can't make that assumption. And, um, and there are people that I know I'm hugging who haven't been probably touched in maybe years, Right? some of the elderly young men. Um, hmm. There are people who, who just are, are there. And in that presence, there is a way to connect with someone and just communicate. And sometimes when you start picking up what's going on, you can feel something break inside of them. Hmm. And then you're just there to say, you're not alone, you're safe. Um, I, did, I was in a women's prison, and I violated pretty much all the rules. I'm surprised I didn't ever, you know, I, I made it out. And, um, and the, the warden calls up the person who brought me into the women's prison and he, and the next day and says, you do know that Paul pretty much violated every rule we had, you know. And, um, and I wasn't trying to. I'm a missionary kid, so we get in trouble just because we're missionary kids. And we don't understand some things, you know. But... Um, and my friend apologized, says, I'm so sorry. And he says, no, no, no. He says, I've never seen anything like that. And it's going to change entirely the way that we do our work inside the prison. And um, there was a woman there who I, I just hugged and, and, and didn't let her go. And I felt the thing to say to her, to whisper to her, was, you're safe. And she just fell apart. That hug transformed that woman's life. I mean, when she got out and uh, she started just talking about the fact that that was the first time in her life that a man had ever touched her and she felt safe. 
So it's a powerful thing, and it's not trite. And when, I'm, when I give you a hug, it's because I see you. I really do, and it's taken most of my life to get to that place where I feel that sense of being present with someone. Part of it is just learning how to live inside the grace of the day. But um, thank you. Nobody has ever, I don't think, has ever asked me that. So ah. I appreciate that. So one follow-up on that. I, it seems to me one of the challenges of being a public person, which you've become, or at least you are in settings like this, and, yeah. and having done work that really matters to people, you've really touched people. And, and you're so generous. And so many people I meet who have done that kind of work and have achieved the level of recognition you have are actually very protective of themselves. And I think I understand why they're that way. So yeah. how, what do you do to protect yourself at the same time? Maybe you don't feel like you need to, but... I don't, I don't. I, I actually trust the Holy Spirit about that. Huh. You know, it took me 50 years to finally become a child, and I'm not going back to being an adult. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm serious, right? <clears throat> And, and, and a couple of things that are so true with children until, until they've been abandoned or hurt or damaged is one, they know how to trust until they learn somebody teaches them that trust is dangerous. They know how to play. They love to be surprised and they know how to live inside just the grace of one day. And we're not called to be childish. So there is a maturity that comes in our lives, but we're always encouraged to, to remain a child. And especially when we begin to understand that we've got a relationship with a God who is father, who is parent, right? This is about learning how to just trust inside the grace of a day. And so in that encounter, when I'm, when I'm living in, the, in just one day, because sufficient to the day is the grace, when I learn how to do that rather than living in some future tripping imagination that doesn't actually exist, I'm able to be present to the person in front of me rather than off in some, some other place. And the beautiful thing is that, that God loves to participate in that moment because God is actually always present with us. And we get to play inside of that. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. You must know Chesterton's line, we have sinned and grown old and our father is younger than we. Absolutely. And I, and I love that line. It's, it's somewhere in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so the movie is out. Um, m not many movies that are based on books are, are always better than the book. I think it's fair to say. But they're always different. They're always different. And, and so I'm curious. Uh, I don't know how involved you were in the process of making the movie. Maybe you could share a little about, about that. But what do you think the movie actually did get, was able to do... Um, in a different way or a better way than the, than the book did? Um, it's a different medium. A book um, engages you differently than even the audio book does. People who have heard the audio book, it's a very different experience than even the written book. Um, and movie, again, involves a, a lot more of you that, than, is, than is open. And so you get to see things that penetrate without you realizing it and without you, you're a lot more passive inside of a, an image-based presentation. And it's power, part of the power of it. Um, the hard thing is to take, especially a book that is so dialogue-centered, which The Shack is, and uh, to translate that on, onto a screen. That is a, a gift to be able to do that. And movies are incredibly collaborative. They're every person that is engaged is bringing a skill set and a heart and, and an imagination and a vision for what their participation is. And so all of that begins to work together. It's pretty magnificent to watch and to, and to be on the sidelines of. I think uh, part of the power of this movie is because those who created and worked on it were already impacted by the book. Many of them, like Gil Netter, who did Life of Pi, and Marley I Mean Blindside, he's a producer. He already knew the book, and it already had rippled through his family. And his wife, Lonnie, who is a co-producer, is a shack evangelist, right? So he had her to deal with, right? So 
But because the book had rippled out like this, Stuart Hazeldean, who's the director, loves Jesus, loves the book. Um, you know, the kids that were playing the characters for Kate and Josh, uh, Megan and Gage, they came with their own copies so that I'd sign them, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. Joseph Nemec, who did the set design work, he, he so loved the book and wanted to, to work on this. So you get people who are already engaged that way, you can see it in terms of the impact of the story on the screen. And it's one of the best book to screen adaptations I've ever seen. So those who love the book won't be disappointed by the movie. And there are certain things that I didn't write in the book. That is, you couldn't see the facial expressions, you know, that show up on the screen and the nuances of it. And it's like, oh my goodness, to see that played out right in front of you, it hits you in a way that um, the book couldn't. The book has other things that it does in a way that the film can't. So it's... It was an amazing experience being a part of that. There's something so visceral about the, you said that you're passive in a way with images, but they also involve you in this total way. I, I didn't get to see the movie yet. I only watched the trailer, and I was already weeping like three shots into the trailer. I was I a mess. And, and, it, and it gives I, that you didn't a happen taste. with the book, right? I mean, it takes yeah. at least four pages. Well, <laughs> but, but a lot of people have trouble just, with the first chapter, I know. Yeah, the trailer right away grabs you, and it's just very emotionally powerful. And, but we, and we live in an image-centered culture and world now in, in many respects, and so we're used to engaging that way. And, uh, but it does. The trailer itself was just a taste of how powerful the film is. So let's talk about the book itself, uh, because it, uh, it has this kind of amazing history, which maybe is worth saying, that this was, we have a saying in publishing, I know you've heard it, nobody writes a bestseller. Nobody ever writes a bestseller. Right. It's the audiences that make that. And every, especially every first book uh, has you know, roughly a snowball's chance in the nether regions of making it. Texas. And, uh, <laughs> snowball's <laughs> chance in Texas, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Waco, specifically, perhaps. Um, and. And so you didn't write this even at all with commercial intent? Not at all. Zero. Um, <clears throat> I, and I've told some of you already that I wrote this because I was trying to do like the Bible says and submit to my wife. And um, <laughs> it, it says that. It says submit one to another and she's one of the others. Right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, you're a little, okay, it's late. You had a lot of food. All right. So... Um, Kim had been asking me for a while, because I've written all my life. It was my way to, to get my inside world out when I was growing up. And I learned to write by reading. I was a voracious reader. And so um, after the first half of my uh, life, when a lot of my writing was pretty dark, I began to write gifts. As my heart healed, I began to write gifts for friends and family. Poetry and songs and short stories and, you know, the normal stuff that people do. You give to your friends and family and they think you're great, you know, because they're your friends and family. And uh, so Kim had said, you know, someday as a gift for our children, and we have six, who the youngest was 13 at the time. She said, would you please write something that puts in one place how you think because you think outside the box. And, um, and I did not feel healthy enough as a human being to actually do that until the year I turned 50. And the year I turned 50, we had nothing. I was working three jobs, but I had 40 minutes each way on the train to one, my major job. And that gave me time. And plus, I felt for the first time in my life, you know what? I, I'm like one of the healthiest people that I know. And, <laughs> and it was a big surprise. <laughs> and like, maybe I could do this, because I have nothing else for Christmas for them this year. And I wrote a story on the train, made 15 copies at Office Depot, uh, that did everything I ever wanted that book to do. Um, gave six to the kids at Christmas, Kim got a copy, and the rest, the, the extras I just gave to my friends. And I went back to work. Uh, it didn't cross my, my mind one time to write this thing. And, uh, you know, you give a book to your kids for Christmas, it's like, ah, oh, a book, thanks, Dad. <laughs> you know? it's and I got, one step up from socks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll get right on that, you know. And, um, and they all did and, and, and loved it. By the way, when the book eventually got into public print, my wife said to me, she said, you know, when I asked you to write this, I was kind of thinking four to six pages. 
You know? <laughs> but it was my friends who started giving it away that started this huge chain reaction that nobody saw coming, especially the publishers. They, 26 of them turned it down, which didn't bother me because I had no expectations to begin with. So. And what you wrote is a story, and it's an artful story. Um, it also has elements of allegory, I suppose. I want to talk about that a little bit because, um, I, I'm going to say honestly, I did not want to bring this up because I don't think it's a big deal. But I have heard, <laughs> even recently, It's probably my mom. With the, <laughs> with the movie coming out, People are re-examining this amazing story of the shack, and, they, and there, was, there was and is a lot of concern about what exactly you're trying to accomplish theologically in the book. The book makes, it presents a picture of God. Uh -huh. It's a, a picture of God that is unfamiliar uh, in all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. um, although in other ways deeply connected to Christian doctrine. And there's been a lot of theological critique of the book. And I would say uh, two things. As former, you know, uh, a former editor at Christianity Day magazine, someone who tries to think about theology, if I just read it for the theology, I don't know that I would assign it as a sort of systematic theology textbook. I wouldn't. Safely, right? <laughs> but I didn't ever read it that way. Yeah. I read it as an artful story mm -hmm. that is trying to say something uh, that's trying to bypass certain things and say something deeply true. Yeah. And, and it frustrates me to even have to bring this up, but I think maybe the value of talking about what you weren't, were and weren't trying to do theologically is we could actually have a conversation about what's the role of this kind of artful story. Yep. Um, you, you portray God the Father as a figure uh, who calls herself Papa, but is, is portrayed in the book and the film as a black woman. Um, and... I suppose people aren't particularly upset by that, but, but there's this sense that like the trinity The black is, part or the woman part? Well, maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I think we could guess. <laughs> but I think, well, C.S. Lewis portrayed uh, this uh, sort of the sun figure as a lion. Uh -huh. I don't think God is really a lion either. So let's talk about- He's a lion of the about, tribe of Judah. I guess that helps. Well, that, hel that helps. Yeah. So let's talk about okay. what was the, the and, goal of this. And, and just so you know that most of that critique comes from my own people. That is, they're my people, right? Modern evangelical fundamentalists, that's where I grew up. Missionary kid, preacher's kid. So be careful how you talk about them. I'm just telling you, because they're my people. And, uh, and, and, and let me say this. The, on <laughs> the only time you'll find God in a box is because he wants to be where we are. The only time, listen, the only time you'll find God in a box is because he wants to be where we are. God has never had boxes. All of them is what we bring to the table. And a lot of us in our boxes are trying to find a way toward the longing that exists in our heart and deal with the fear that we've engaged with growing up inside of our religious conditionings and cultures and a lot of it intended for good that became impediments to actual relationship. Religion is a very difficult distance to go when you're talking about relationship with God. That's been true in the life of Jesus. It's always been true throughout history. And so we need to understand that. And, and just so you know that this is close to home as well, when my, my mother, right, she tried to read the shack and because uh, she heard about it from her hairdresser. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and her doctor, right? And so she gave it her best shot because none of her other kids had written a book. And uh, so she thought it would be a good idea. Well, when Papa came through the door the first time, she shut the book and picked up the phone and called my sister. Hey, Debbie, your brother's a heretic, right? Now, she's past that, and I could, I could spend a lot of time telling you that story, but she's great now, loves the shack. Doesn't understand it, but that's all right. And um, so when I wrote this, I'm coming from a history that involves some great sadnesses, a difficult 
painful relationship with my dad who, who, who the chip for being a dad was broken in him before I ever showed up as his son. Hmm. His dad had just destroyed that. Orphaned when he was 12, ended up working, uh, you know, children's services, shipped all the boys out to farm labor, living, living in the barns, watching the families through the window. At 14, he runs away into the logging camps, which you know is a very kind and generous and engaging, affirming kind of place. And uh, Lots of hugs in the Yeah, log. yeah. <laughs> at, at 18, has a massive encounter at a camp revival, Sawdust Trail revival meeting with Jesus, walks straight into Bible school, meets my mom, they get married. I'm born in Grand Prairie, Alberta, and when I'm a year old, we go to the highlands of New Guinea as pioneer missionaries where I grow up. So you can see even in that little description that he didn't have a large capacity. He was an angry young man and, and didn't know what to do with all that fury. Um, and I grew up believing that only the righteous man was allowed to be angry. So I, I didn't actually get angry until I was 38 years old. And I just buried all of that. And it came out as shame and all these other things. Sexual abuse was a part of my childhood. And it was in the tribal culture. And then it was at missionary boarding school when I was sent away at six. And uh, issue of belonging. So I, I carried all of those things with me. And I grew up with a God that was a lot like my dad, and it took me 50 years to wipe the face of my own father off the face of God. And so I'm writing this story at 50 for my kids, and I'm saying, let me tell you about the character and nature of the God who actually showed up and healed my heart, not the God I grew up with. Because the God I grew up with was a distant darkness behind Jesus. In fact, he was the omni-being watching from the infinite distance of a disapproving heart. And I couldn't win his affection and approval because it was all based on my behavior. And obviously, I couldn't win my father's either. Hmm. And so I'm saying, like, how do I communicate to my kids the character and nature of this God who showed up? And I went as far away from Gandalf with a bad attitude, Zeus God, as I could get. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and out comes Papa. And you know what? God is not more male than female. All of maternity and all of paternity originate in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. And that is orthodox theology. Hmm. Did, you, did, you know, did you know that the word mercy, which dominates the Hebrew scriptures, comes from the same root as the word womb. So every time you deal with the mercy of God, you're dealing with the womb love of God. It's gated and hidden waters. And this love is relentless and protective. And so when we, inv when we use imagery in creative work, we're doing nothing that is different that is, than is already in scripture. We've got masculine imagery in scripture. God is father. God is a shepherd. God is a king. We've got feminine imagery. God is a nursing mother in Isaiah, a woman who loses a coin. God is a, is a uh, lion. God is an eagle. God is a mother bear, right? You've got all this image. God is a rock. Hmm. You know, God is a mother hen. I, I tell people, I guess I could have had Papa come through the door as a big hen, but I just don't know if it would have done the same thing. <laughs> You know? Would have made the movie really awkward. It as very. Well. They go like, what? You know, so, but, but when you, but for some of, and we live in a world that has been mostly damaged by men. Through one man, sin entered the world. It wasn't through her. Wow. She was brought forth as a call back, call him back to his humanity. Through one, and eight times in the New Testament makes that declaration. And it never lays the blame at her feet. And that's a whole conversation by itself. But we live in a world where when men turned away from God, when Adam turns from God, he doesn't even turn to a relationship. At least she does. She turns to him, which wasn't a good idea, for identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, and love, community. He turns to the ground and the works of his hands. Wow. Right? And even when he begins to understand relationship, because that is what God is all about, 
God is about relationship. Even when he, when he turns toward relationship, he treats it as territory and property. And men have devastated the planet. And a lot of us who've been hurt by men, we struggle with the imagery of God as Father. And it takes some time and the gentleness of God who comes to us in different ways. Maybe as a rock, you know? Maybe as a strong tower. Maybe as a mother bear. Maybe as a nursing mother. Maybe as a woman who loses a coin. All these different... Imagery was never intended to define God. Hmm. Imagery was intended to open up a window so that we could see some facet of the character and nature nature of God. And that's the beauty of, of playing with imagery. And let me tell you, as much as there is pushback, which I think is a good thing. I'm not opposed to criticism and pushback and all that. I'm, I'm fine with that, as long as you don't go after my kids, right? <laughs> and sadly, that's happened too. But, but I'm, I'm okay with that. And, and in the midst of of this kind of conversation, which we need to have. We need to have this. There is an attraction toward a God who is like a mother who is relentless. And then we also need to deal with the whole maternal as well as paternal reality of the character and nature of God. We're made in the image of God and that's male, female. Uh -huh. And we need that bigger conversation. And it strikes me, I, I don't want to get too off in the theological weeds, though. I think this is actually quite deep, what you're saying. Uh, it, it seems to me there's this constant need in the Hebrew Scriptures and then in the New Testament to destabilize idolatry. Yeah. So the, the whole point of the revelation of God in the Hebrew Scriptures is that you can't make a graven image of this God, like all the other gods around them. But it's so interesting that rather than the, the strategy then being, well, so now we will not attempt to speak in any kind of imagery at all of God. Instead, the Hebrew scriptures kind of multiply imagery precisely to con in poetry and in different kinds of prophetic yeah. speech to constantly keep destabilizing our assumption that we figured out who this God is. And then, of course, in some ways, Jesus is the ultimate destabilizing of idolatry, right? He Absolutely, breaks because he's a, all yeah. expectations of what this God yeah. is meant to be. And he's person. Yeah. He's person, and that includes relationship, which includes mystery, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. When, you, when you enter relationship, you enter a mystery and you lose control. Ask any married man, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the beauty of relationship, and, and that is what God is about. God is not about religion. God has never been religious. Any religion that is brought to the table, we did it, right? Because God didn't have an order of service. There's not like, well, who's doing communion this week, you know, or where are we meeting, you know? So, I mean, think about it. God has never been a religious being. So all religion is what we brought to the table. And the beauty of God, in part, is that God will climb in and submit to our religion and then destroy it from the inside by love so that we can be free of the boxes and the impediments that we have created and crafted around us to give us a sense of control over our lives. Does that mm. make sense? Mm. Hmm. All right, let me ask you about the shack. Okay. The shack is the house inside you that other people help you build. I've heard you say that. Yeah. Can you expand on that? So, I mean, you can read the story as just a story, but I wrote it with layers for my kids. And, and they know that I'm both Mackenzie and Missy. You know, Mackenzie mm -hmm. Allen Phillips and Missy um, Ann Phillips, both spell map for on purpose. Um, a writer from Nashville said, you know, my sense is that Missy represents something murdered in you as a child, probably your innocence, and Mackenzie is you as the adult trying to deal with it. And, and I showed it to Kim. She said, boy, she nailed it. Wow. And the house on the inside is... is represented by the place we get stuck, shack, but it's also our own soul. That's our heart. And when it's broken, and I'm thrilled when I hear stories of people who grew up inside affirmation and encouragement and the wonder of affection and all of that. And a lot of us, we didn't get that. 
we did not get good help, and it's not because somebody was trying to hurt us. They did the best they, can, they did with what they had. But that's the place we then store our addictions and hide all of our secrets and is the place of shame and disgust. I mean, we don't want anybody to ever come in that place because we're terrified. We will see a look on their face that is the same disgust that we see in the mirror. And that's where we store our secrets. So we're not telling any, we, we become performers. Ways to cover up and hide. We create a facade 100 yards out from the shack that we can paint as fast as we can pick up people's expectations. And we learn to live from the outside in because we got nothing on the inside that is worthy of living out from. And the beauty of what God does is that he's going to communicate to you at some point in this journey, I've always loved the shack. I've always loved you. Not your facade. I'm not into the uh -huh. facade. Right? You can put all your effort in that. I'll be right here. But I want you to know that I'm not just love the shack, that's where I live. And that's the beauty of a God who comes from inside out in terms of that metaphor, uh, the house on the inside. And that's his intention, is to heal us so that we become whole people. So I want to try to make a connection, see what you think of this. I had a little resistance when you talked about God's never been into religion because I thought about two things God gave to his people, a tabernacle and a temple which are kind of religious things. But I am wondering in some way if the tabernacle slash temple is the redeemed shack, that is the dwelling place of God. And then when Paul says, you are the temple of God, and I think he in different places maybe uses that both individually, like your body, each of you, yep. and you together, you guys. And I think you're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're way ahead of me. But isn't this about ultimately God changing that center of us that we think could never be the dwelling of God and could never even in a way be our own dwelling? Yep. And actually God wants to take up residence in that place and that place is going to become... So temple. when he says you are the temple, there's two words in the Greek. There's yeah. Irene and Naos, Naos yeah. right? Naos is the holy of holies. It is the cube that was designed. And when it says you are the temple, it's naos, right? It's not the outer courts, it's not the, it's naos. And so that picture that God then places inside humanity is to tell you the truth about who you are. That's the beauty of what's going on. If you start with God is not a religious being but is a God who submits by nature. Again, People freak out about that because their, their idea of sovereignty is karma, that God is in control and therefore everything that happens is part of God's plan, right? If, God is, if part of God's plan is evil, right, then you have nowhere to run for safety. I'm sorry. You can't trust a God who is not good all the time. And so this is not karma. This is relationship. And we're talking about something that is mysterious and beautiful. But if God is not religious, but a God who submits by nature, and if you want evidence of that, take a look at your baby. Take a look at your little girl or little boy. That is a God who submitted to two human beings' choices and gave life to that child that will become an eternal being because of their choices, regardless of what their intent was or commitment was or anything else. Wow. The cross is the greatest obvious example of God's submission to human beings climbing on our torture device to destroy its power, right? We brought the cross to the table. It is a dark torture machine that has nothing to do with light, but God knew that if he creates, that would be something that had to be dealt with, and God did it by submitting to it. So what does God do about our religion? Well, we've got a whole world that requires magic and uh, religious in a sense and also appeasement and sacrifice so what does God do God climbs into it and says all right I want you to know I'll send the prophets and they're going to tell you clearly I hate sacrifice I hate it I hate it right but you seem to want to need it so I'm going to provide it myself hmm. Jehovah Jireh so the story of Abraham and Isaac is not about God wanting to sacrifice our kids. It's about God saying, I don't. We're going to start lesson number one. 
No child sacrifice. And if you need a sacrifice, I will provide myself, Jehovah Jireh. Again, you've got God working inside of our limited understandings and, and because God has a high respect for humanity, the choices that we make matter. So he's not just going to rip us out of our own prisons. He's going to climb in the prisons and wait till we're willing to let these prisons go and then help us walk out. Yeah. You've shared um, quite publicly, at least publicly enough that it's on YouTube, a lot of the story behind, uh, behind how you came to write this book. And a lot of it involves marriage. And I wonder if we could talk about that uh, for Absolutely. a little bit. Um, in my experience, I've, as I've gotten to know people well enough to find out, it seems like my friends who are married divide into roughly two groups. And half of them had an amazing first year of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and the other half had a really, really difficult first year of marriage. Yep. And it was such a relief to find out about that second half and realize it really is about 50%. I would say probably is that my marriage was in that 50%. I think yours was too. It is. Um, and you then had a real crisis, but you then started to climb out of it. And how long, and let's... Let's uh, probably don't have time to go into all the details of the crisis, but let's start at that moment of profound crisis, profound loss of trust, and how long did it take to get out, and what were the steps that got you both out yeah, together? Just, yeah, just so for clarity's sake, the point of crisis came uh, with a one-sentence phone call from Kim in January 4th, 94. And you need to understand, Kim Young saved my life but she paid a really high price for it. January 4th, 94, I get a one sentence phone call that says, I'm waiting for you at your office and I know. And what she knows is I'm in a three month affair with one of her best friends. And at that point, I had to make a decision whether to face my stuff, which I had buried for years, or kill myself. Those were my two options. And killing myself would have been the last way to run away before hitting the bottom. And I don't to this day know how I made it across town and drove into, the office, into my office spot and walked in where Kim had already dismantled the office and faced the wrath of God, which I now am convinced is also the love of God, opposed to everything that is not of love's kind. And I'm here to tell you that exposure is a gift as terrifying and as difficult as it is, it is a gift. And when I faced her that first day, I told her, if we're going to do this, I need to tell you every secret that I have. And naively, she said, bring it on. And it took me four days to tell her everything she didn't know. And I told her every secret I had and answered everything every question she had and it destroyed her and she said I'll never believe another word that comes out of your mouth the rest of your life but she believed I'd hit the bottom as furious as she was and it took Kim and I 11 years to completely heal 11 years the first thing that I did to let go of control was pull the yellow pages off the shelf looked under counselors started with the A's worked my way down got to Agape Youth and Family Services, and if you know agape, that's the Greek word for love, which is other-centered self-giving, and it is God is love, and I needed some kind of unconditional love. And I walked in, and Scott Mitchell became my therapist and my friend, and we began the arduous, hard, grinding, day-by-day -day work of dealing with all my stuff. And it took, he told me it was going to take a year and a half. And at nine months, he said, you're done. And I said, it's only been nine months. And he said, you need to understand, we've never had anybody work this hard and stick with it. And it was life or death for me. Kim was furious. I mean, every day that I'd tell her what was going on in counseling, she'd say, yeah, right, whatever. <laughs> and that was okay, because at this point, I knew I couldn't even heal myself. 
How would I have the audacity to think that I could heal her? And I didn't go to counseling to fix my marriage, save it. I'd already blown all of that up. But, but the, the adultery didn't become the new secret either. So I now had started to make decisions that I will never live in secret again. And I live this way. I don't have any secrets. And through that process of dismantling my world, which included who I thought God was and who I thought I was as a human being and dealing with some of the underlying lies that existed in my theology, whether I was told outright or just picked it up because of my own shame. And that started an 11 year process of rebuilding that is represented by Mackenzie's weekend in the shack. When I, when I wrote The Shack, I didn't want to write an 11-year book. Uh, War and Peace in Oregon, you know. So, so I squeezed this process down into, into a weekend of dismantling and rebuilding. And at the end of those, and just so you know, Kim and I are the best we've ever been. And better than we could have ever been even though there were times along that journey where she's going like, can we just go back to faking it? It's gotta be easier than actually <laughs> dealing with it. Do you understand? It's a wildly difficult, arduous thing, and it is worth the work. But out of that, on the train to one of my three jobs, we have nothing for Christmas, I write a story for my kids saying like, I didn't know that you could come to healing this side of death. And I didn't know that I could be the same person in every situation and that I, I could live without addictions and without the burden of secrets that had kept me absolutely locked away from relationships. And so Kim, 13 years into this, says, in front of a group of friends who knew my story. She says, uh, I never thought I would ever say this. We're talking Minnesota, North Dakota gal, right? Where there's no 50 shades of nothing. <laughs> right? yeah. Her and her five sisters are called the force and may the force be with you, yes? But she says, I never thought I'd ever say this, but it was all worth it. And, and she's not saying, it's not saying that the ends justify the means. Let's totally get that out of our worlds. There's nothing that justifies betrayal and adultery. There's nothing that justifies the cross. So this is not about coming up with excuses because God is able to climb into that devastation and actually grow something alive in it. She's saying... It's worth it because there is nothing so broken that God can't heal it or nothing so lost that he doesn't know where it is or nothing so dead that he can't plant a seed that will grow into something you don't expect. Mm. So that's kind of the story of that loss. And, it, and, it, and it, I needed therapy. I needed someone, someone that had a sense of being safe that I could have this conversation with and begin someone who knew what they were doing. And I asked him the first day, Scott, I said, I don't just need you to ask how I feel about this. Can you actually get me from A to Z? And he said, yeah. And it'll take a year and a half. And I said, I'm in. He said, yeah, everybody says they're in. But they bail out right after they feel better about themselves and a little more in control. And at that point, I'd hit the bottom. I said, I, I don't even know. I don't even trust myself to know when I'm done. So I'm not leaving until you tell me I'm done. I did the work, and the work paid off. I'm a much better human being than I've ever been. I wouldn't want to go through that journey again, but I wouldn't want to go through being the child that experienced the things that I did either, right? I didn't make those choices, but I owned what I did, and in owning it, there opened up a path inside community and inside relationship and inside exposure that moved me toward authenticity and allowed me to become a child which I had never been able to as a child. And for that, 
I'm eternally grateful, and I'm so thankful to Kim, who didn't give up on me, but remained furious because the level of her fury pushed me to deal with the level of darkness. And I am eternally grateful for that. Two thoughts, and I want to pose you a little challenge as we end. Um, a good, good kind of challenge, not like a mad critic challenge. Uh, there is a tradition, you know, Christian theology is a really tricky business because we are trying to do justice to this astonishing news, right? There is a tradition that goes back to Augustine called the Felix Culpa tradition, which means in Latin, oh, happy fall or happy fault. And at its extreme, it can go too far and say, God always willed sin so that the incarnation would happen. That's probably too far. But it's only just slightly too far because the Felix Culpa idea is God has made so much that is beautiful out of this mess that we can almost say, oh, happy moment <laughs> when we fell because what God has restored is so much greater than even what was there before. And at some very dark and challenging moments in my own marriage, one line that has just been absolutely essential to us and I think has saved us was, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Absolutely. And I just feel like you've given us, all of us, such hope that whatever our fall or fault, <laughs> there is so much abundance on the other side. So the opportunity or challenge would be, you know, we're wrapping up here. What would you call us to who are listening to you right now? What, do you, what would you call us to or say to us? Boy. When you were talking, I was reminded, do you, do you know that Japanese art where they put the gold in the cracks? There's a name for that. No. Cloisonne is the French word, but there is a Japanese there word. There is a well. Japanese word for it, where they take an ordinary broken vessel, a household item, but they, they fix it by putting gold in all the cracks so that it becomes more precious even. And, and so the first thing that I thought of when you were talking was, that's, that is such a beautiful piece of work that, that expresses a God who climbs into our darkness. It's the same thing as the cross being a torture device that, that Jesus submits to in order to transform it into an icon and a monument of grace that is so precious that I would wear it on my ring or around our necks. My encouragement is begin to understand that aloneness is a lie. God is, has never been alone. Aloneness doesn't exist in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Kurt was talking about this today, that that's the first not good. So any not good cannot originate in God. It has to originate in us. And we're made in the image of God who's never been alone. We're designed for community. My life has become an icon in that same sense as the cross has. I'm evidence that God will climb into the deepest broken places and begin to transform something into something that is actually alive and tell me the truth about who I am that was true the whole way along. I was a very good creation before anything got broken. I'm made in the image of, a, of God and in the likeness of God like you are. That is the truth of who you are. And when you begin to understand the truth of who you are, the way of who you are will begin to match it. 
and you're so beautifully crafted, meticulously made, that only God who crafted you and understands the warping of sin and loss and betrayal and abandonment and knows how to capture all of that to make you a sound that you've never been, that includes it but redeems it. The violin makers, and I have a friend, Martin Schleski, who makes world-class violins. And he says that in the old days, the guys used to go up uh, where the rivers connected, and they would listen to the logs bumping into each other to find the singer trunks. Because there are certain trunks that are called singers. And that's the ones that they make violins out of. He says now they go for months into the woods with a tuning fork, hitting the trunks, looking for the singers. And when they find a singer, they found out something about these trunks, that they're usually in a grove of trees, but if a tree next to a singer goes down, the light that hits that trunk from the sun and the different effect of the wind because of the, of the tree that went down changes the molecular structure in the singer. It is absolutely beautiful. And he said, God is a master craftsman, not a divine mathematician in the sense that this is not a master plan. But he comes and, and the story of our lives is not about the wood submitting to the artist. It's about the artist submitting to the wood. And God comes to you with all of our brokenness and everything else and he submits to what is there. And the planer and everything else that begins to work on us allows the sound of that singer to emerge that includes all the ways the wind has hit it, all the adversities that that tree has experienced. This is a God who wastes nothing. Nothing. Feeds the 5,000 and makes sure that nothing is lost. Pick up all the bits and pieces. And I stand here as one of the bits and pieces. But he wastes nothing. And my life is that kind of a memorial and it's something that I give my kids and I give my grandchildren. And I'm thrilled to participate in whatever this thing is that I'm involved with, but I don't need it. I already know who I am. And I already hear the whisper. And I can hear it clearly now better than ever. I'm especially fond of you. And I celebrate that that is the truth of every single one of you. And when you begin to understand the truth of your being and learn how to agree with that in the power of the Holy Spirit, the way of your being will naturally match it to the praise of his glory. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much.